Welcome back to Age of Monotremes, my collaborative pitch for an animated speculative evolution TV show. In this alternate timeline of the Earth, the only mammals to have survived the asteroid which wiped out the dinosaurs were the monotremes, the egg-laying mammals such as the platypus and echidna. With little competition, they evolve and make our planet theirs with staggering diversity. From the tiny bug eaters and fearsome hunters to roaming herds and ocean titans. When we left off, we had introduced the monotremes as a group, all their extremely unique biology and their history. In our timeline, they spent millions of years becoming masters of the water, culminating in the modern secret agent known as the platypus and their insect-loving cousins, the echidnas. But what would it take for these animals to have gone even further? Not just as permanent specialists, but occupying the roles that other mammals did in our version of Earth. On top of that, what would the rest of life on Earth look like? What about all the plants, the fish, the birds, and others? While a definitive answer will be out of reach without interdimensional portal tech, which is always out of stock at Walmart for some reason, we can instead combine scientific knowledge and imagination to come up with a scenario imagining such. I'd like to think that that's exactly what I'm trying to share with you now. Not a prediction, but a vision. I'm not claiming this is exactly what could have happened, but it never hurts to dream. One thing is clear though, for the age of monotremes to begin, another age must die first. 200 million years ago, the Triassic mass extinction wiped out three out of four species. With the splitting of Pangaea, the Rausukians, Temnospondyls, and Basal Thorapsids which had previously ruled, had either receded or disappeared entirely. The slate was wiped clean, and animals once irrelevant became success stories. Among them was a strange group of semi-aquatic mammals that split off very early from those that would dominate our timeline. These were the monotremes, the egg-laying mammals. Over the next 135 million years, they would persist and perfect their niche. By the end of the Cretaceous period, they were exquisitely adapted to hunt invertebrates amongst the rivers and streams. Their snouts were lined with powerful sensors, their ears drastically reduced to avoid drag, and their sprawled, webbed feet made them energized swimmers. Since their first appearance, the world has gone through great changes. Even so long after Pangaea, the continents were in odd shapes, as South America, Antarctica, and Australia sat in close proximity. The hothouse climate let conifers and ferns dominate, as flowering plants made serious strides in the background. It is at this time that reptiles ruled the earth. Dinosaurs and crocodile relatives had conquered the land. Pterosaurs ruled the skies, and marine reptiles plumbed the depths. But the mammals, to which the monotremes belonged, prospered in their own way. Placentals, which would evolve into everything from armadillos to oxen in our timeline, as well as the pouch-bearing marsupials, had been around since the Jurassic, along with the Australis phenidens, tribos phenids, and especially the rodent-like multi-tuberculates, just to name a few, were making many livings in the shadows of the dinosaurs exploiting any food source and habitat they could. While most mammals thrived and expanded, the egg-laying mammals maintained their narrow path through deep time, as specialists of the Gondwanan waters. However, this verdant garden was about to burn, and the fortune of these bizarre specialists was about to change forever. An asteroid struck the Yucatan Peninsula with billions of times the energy of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima in World War II. After the initial shockwaves and firestorms, a thick blanket of resulting debris rose to the high atmosphere, starving plants of sunlight and ending the Mesozoic era with ecological collapse. This may sound familiar to us, but this is when the history of one universe splits off from our own. In our timeline, around 75% of all species would perish, and with the fall of the great reptiles, Earth would belong to the widespread and adaptable Therian mammals giving rise to the bountiful species that live today, including us. In this alternate timeline, however, the impact was somehow even worse, perhaps due to this timeline's version of the Chicxulub asteroid being somewhat larger, killing off nearly 90% of life on Earth. Here, along with the non-avian dinosaurs, almost all mammals perished too. 
including the pouched marsupials and our own ancestors, the placentals, which gave birth to live young. Only one group of mammals endured through this apocalypse, the monotremes, as they were luckily adapted to one of the few habitats not as starkly disturbed, freshwater systems. These were the last mammals, and their evolution from this point would change the world forever. Okay, so I mentioned in the last video how much of a scientist I am not. And sure enough, it's been found that a few bits of info in there were incorrect. So before we continue, let's correct some of that very briefly. I said that monotremes don't have external ears, or pinnae, but they actually do. They're just highly vestigial, adapted to reduce drag in the water. You know what else they have? Stomachs. They're just unable to produce digestive acids and lack a thick inner lining to that organ. At least one of my sources said that does not make them true stomachs, so this is why I said they lack stomachs in that video. I spotted this one myself. I drew here that monotremes use ZW chromosomes instead of the XY chromosomes used by other mammals. This is false. It, totally, totally false. They use XY chromosomes like us. I just totally misread that article. My bad. I have not been able to find any confirmation of my claim that crocodiles can see UV light. There were a number of interesting articles that said they have limited color vision, but nothing about ultraviolet vision. That came about as I assumed that they'd have it in the same way that many other reptiles do. And finally, echidnas are not solely myrmecophages. They don't just eat ants and termites, but incorporate a number of insects and even plants into their diet. I know this is an artistic endeavor and not a scholarly one, but misinformation is always a prevalent problem for the spread of actual knowledge, and I don't want to enable it. So thank you for everybody who caught these errors in the comments. I'll try not to make them again. So now that my conscience is cleared, we may proceed. It took millions of years for the Earth to recover as the Cenozoic era began. But in this alternate timeline, this healed world ended up quite different from ours. The geography and climate would go about a similar history as in our own timeline, but life on this planet would be noticeably different as the smaller pool of extinction survivors built up a biosphere with a distinct character. Flowering plants would endure and thrive, but never overwhelmingly dominate the way they did in our timeline. Instead, the uneasy balance between themselves and the gymnosperms would persist, resulting in bizarre analogs to the forests, jungles, and grasslands we're familiar with. In fact, grasses are extinct here. That group of plants vanished along with the dinosaurs, as then they weren't as well established. Instead, horsetails, a type of spore-bearing water plant still seen in our world, would adapt to live in drier environments and pollinate with the wind. Now, they cover a third of the Earth's land masses. Invertebrates were largely unaffected, as expected. Meanwhile, fish look surprisingly different. Fossil and genetic evidence suggests that the vast majority of fish diversity in our timeline emerged after the KPG event, largely due to the previously dominant fish groups dying out. Indeed, the gill enjoyers went through a similar power shift as the tetrapods would on land. In this timeline, the ancestors of great white sharks, pufferfish, and many other familiar species would not make it, while the waters are ruled instead by seal accounts carp relatives, ground sharks, and many more. Groups whose ancestors endured in freshwater and deep sea ecosystems more resilient to the then abundant detritus than the ash-choked sunlight. Reptiles and birds look more divergent still for a surprising reason. Since monotremes started off as southern hemisphere endemics before they'd spread across the globe, and other mammal groups are totally absent, that means the northern hemisphere is vacant of mammals likely until the Eocene epoch. While birds and reptiles endured across the globe, North America and Eurasia would become the origin points for some unexpected success stories, but we'll leave that for another time. But of course, we're here to talk about one group in particular, the last of the mammals, the monotremes. With no other mammals to compete with, these animals engage in an adaptive radiation, filling empty niches by splitting into all kinds of new species with all kinds of new lifestyles. During the Paleogene, these would serve as the ancestors for the larger groups that make up their evolutionary tree in this timeline. Full disclosure, my team and I are currently brainstorming ideas for all kinds of new groups, so today we're just going to talk about three of these very odd innovators. It started small at first, between those with bills and those without. The Ornithorhynchians were initially very platypus-like, with leathery bills for sensing prey underwater. 
but they'd explore many more lifestyles. Some went the Echidna route and returned to the land, becoming secondarily terrestrial. This would earn them their name, Stegnoxans, meaning dry again. Their electroreceptors were lost, and their limbs became more erect for efficient walking. The extensive webbing on their front legs was retained though, turning their forefeet into weird two-part shovels as they dug their burrows for shelter and or food. Their claws would break it up, and these weird little mittens would scoop it up to discard it. Their strangest trait though would be their mouth. All monotremes are born with an egg tooth to help hatch from the egg, but Stegnoxans, through Neoteny, kept it into adulthood, becoming a set of keratinous false canines to better handle food in the absence of teeth. Originating in South America, they would diversify there, of course, but in the tropical climate of the Paleogene, storms were common. Over centuries, even millennia, as chunks of vegetation and debris get washed out to sea, some of these chunks might have castaways on board. Among the small fraction of survivors of such freak events, eventually, a population descended from these lost stegnoxins would find themselves in Africa, evolving into new species and clades. It sounds absurd, but this is the current conviction among scientists in our world of how monkeys and rodents ended up in South America from Africa. These stegnoxins would be the first monotremes to enter the old world, and they would eventually make it theirs. Marine reptiles like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs once ruled the Cretaceous seas, but the monotremes, already semi-aquatic millions of years before them, would quickly take advantage of their absence. A group of build monotremes would emerge from the then forested shores of Antarctica to reap the bounty of the healed oceans. Like their platypus counterparts, they retained their electroreception, but they also exaggerated it. Being that their bills are not exactly conducive to facial expressions, some of the superficial muscles of the face receded. Once at though, the depressor labii mandibularis found a new function as electrocytes, organs that produce electricity. These aquatic monotremes can not only sense electricity, but make it themselves, like the electric eel and elephant fish of our world. Combined with their mechanoreceptive push rods, the resulting sensory field around themselves makes it nearly impossible for prey to hide, which is invaluable in the dark ocean depths, along with powerful flippers and giving birth to live young rather than coming ashore to lay eggs, these creatures will become the new masters of the ocean. These are the Fulmignates, the Lightning Jaws. Those are just some of the build monotremes. On the non-build side are the Opoleonids, which are, again, more equipped to live on land than in water. Back in South America, one of these Opoleonids would become more and more specialized for digging. Their legs shortened and strengthened, while their claws became massive and shovel-like. But their standout trait is a head lined with fleshy tentacles and tubercles. When this group split off to live more on land than water, their electric sense became less useful in air than in water forcing reliance on touch instead. Thus, they not only retain their ancestors' push rods, the tiny touch-sensitive organs that line many monotreme snouts, they splendidly exaggerated them into these tendrils. They even merged these organs with the facial groove holding their eyes and ears, now able to fold over and guard them from debris. This would earn them their name, the Chiropsins, meaning hand face. But as finely tuned as these tunnelers became, some would supplement their burrowing by feeding above ground at night an omen of their evolutionary ventures to come. As we on the Age of Monotremes team continue to work on this project behind the scenes, we'll be fleshing out and showing more of this bizarre world, diving into the evolutionary tree of these alternate mammals, as well as the ecosystems and other animals around them. This is a work in progress, but we're super excited to see what we can do with this premise. I mean, we haven't even designed all the basils yet, so there's entire clades we haven't explored yet. And we have a lot to do with the clades that do exist. I mean, Australia is right there. It's, it's right there. It's calling to me like a red dusty siren. We'll be back in a month or two with a lot more to see. Likely a more in-depth video about the Monotreme's current taxonomic tree and our ideas for the creature designs to fit in that. But until then, I want to thank everyone again for their support as we have begun this journey. 
you lift us up to make this show pitch a reality. And maybe, just maybe, a real show one day. Hope you all have a good holiday season, and we'll keep in touch in 2026. Special thanks to all of our supporters on Patreon, including our ancestor tier supporters listed here. If you would like to support our pitch for a speculative evolution animated show and get some cool exclusive rewards, check out our Patreon. Also, subscribe, like, hit the bell, and comment to stay in the loop about a world ruled by egg-laying mammals. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.